Welcome to Level Up. I'm Sherelle. And I'm Danny. And this is the podcast where we talk about health, fitness, and mindset. Fitness fads or future? Trends to watch and watch out for. Mm, I really wanted to have a bit of a fun one today because, as Danny said, fads or future. There is so many fitness fads coming back like in vogue, right? In trend, whether it's like on social media or just in the fitness industry in general. And I just thought it would be really fun today to have a little bit of a chat about some of them. Some are great, some are not so great. And just have like a little bit of an open discussion about one, what you guys should be aware of. And two, maybe what you should start including more of. And it's so interesting where people just hear something once and then they think that that's the only way Mm. and then they ride that out. And it can be a lifetime of people just taking that advice or hearing it that one instance and they go, nope, I'm not deviating from this, irrespective of whether it's actually helping them or not. You Mm. often, and you know, even talking to people who aren't in the industry, your family members, aunties and uncles, mainly people from different generations before technology as well. They go, nope, it has to be this way. And then you kind of go, well, God, at every family reunion, you're sort of doing yeah. the same thing. Like, and it's just not working. At what point do you change? But they'd rather try, fail and struggle and stay in that cycle mm. than actually trying something different. It blows my mind. Mm. Is that when you say that, is there anything that comes to mind of like front of mind of what you're thinking about? More just around dieting, not Mm. so much the training aspect. I think it's just people and what I'm noticing, people struggle the most with weight loss. Yep. Yeah. Nutrition. Yes. Nutrition, right? Like obviously, obviously we've been coaching for a long time, right? And training's like our bread and butter. We love training. It's a big part of what we do. But nutrition and weight loss is society's biggest struggle and not even weight loss but weight maintenance like Mm. we don't have a weight loss problem as a society we have a weight maintenance problem and I think people get so caught up in all the fads and the quick fixes and anything that sounds too good to be true probably is because most people struggle with that the most like getting to the gym three four times a week's pretty not I don't want to say easy but it's the easier component but that's why so many fads exist right is because people struggle with these things and they are serious pain points for a lot of people like serious deep rooted pain points especially for women like weight loss and body composition and how people look and that's why these fads exist that's why a lot of this stuff really does exist is because people know women spend money on beauty more than a lot of Oh, more than men generally we get status through how we look a lot of the in a lot of the world so yeah women spend the money and that's why we're targeted the most in a lot of these fads as well so yeah keen to get into them because it's um as light-hearted as it will be and I know there will probably be a little bit of fighty energy come up today it is a big serious problem right because a lot of people are taken for a ride and a lot of people are manipulated which is really unfortunate yeah not only from coaches which we'll get into but then just society as a whole and it what we see on TV and what we have access to in the supermarkets. You know, obviously we're we're quite blessed in Australia. We have access to good quality foods, but it still costs more. And mm. advertising, there's you put on a sporting game, you get McDonald's, Hungry Jacks, all of those companies mm. are just throwing it in your face. They become easy to access, you know, on a long drive home after work, you just pop over into the servo and get something to eat. So yeah society is also making it a lot harder as well as the old beliefs so yeah we we need to get out of that trap yeah totally absolutely well let's dive into the first one so the first one that I feel like I'm not sure if it's a a fad or a future concept is specialization in advice or coaching so everyone's an expert these days everyone on the internet has an opinion and everyone really does dive into like the real nitty gritty specifics of a lot of things. And one thing I wanted to have a little bit of an open discussion about, cause I'm not sure is like whether this is like a fad, whether it's something that like the rise of social media and I feel like, you know, you see in people's bios, like women between the age of 30 and 35 that struggle to lose four kilos on <laughs> summer holidays in a bikini. It's like, <laughs> why do we have to get that like niched? I don't know. Yeah. Like I see that a lot. And I know that in the business world, they give you that advice to like really niche down, like specific to that, add it to your bio. And I get it. I totally get it. But I don't know if that's fad or the future of fitness. Like, is that the future of fitness where we're actually going to be going into specialized coaching programs that are literally designed for my demographic 
my needs, my pain points, my skin colour. Like I don't even know, is it going to end up so specific that we need that targeted approach or is it the opposite? Is it like maybe that's going to be a fad that rides out and people are going to start seeing through that stuff? I'm not sure. Really good point. And I feel like you need to earn the right to be an expert. And we've said it before, people mm. are just finishing their cert three and four. They go down to the local DJ city or whatever <laughs> microphone store, grab a oh, microphone. I was like, what is that? Is that a new gym? Yeah, the city. DJs, that will be cool. Um, <laughs> they grab a microphone and yeah. then they're an expert and it just grinds our gears, you know. Like they've done none of the groundwork but good on, good on them for having the confidence mm. but I personally think it's best to start more broad. Mm. before niching down but I've done a lot of these sort of bullshit business coaches when I um courses when I was younger just because I was dabbling in every kind how of how many years ago were they like was that 10 oh, years ago yes yeah, so has do you feel like it's changed though like do you feel like the advice that you'll get given then because I wasn't even in this I space 10 years recently, ago though. yeah that's what I mean like I just wonder if there's evolution to it or whether that's just been the way it is for a long time business courses or well I can only judge off the courses that I've done and the people that I um used to log on and <clears throat> download their modules they would say to get very specific but I don't think that that's correct mm. because to to use your example, ages 30 to 35 to lose five kilos of fat, for example. Like everyone is that different that it doesn't really work like that. I think it's their way of trying to get people to say, oh, this person can help me. But mm -hmm. it's all bullshit in my opinion because you need to be able to do the groundwork and work with all kinds of bodies and mm. recognise that, hey, maybe a 20-year-old can use that method as well. Why exactly. does it just have to be 30 to 35? Mm. Things like that. So it kind of, it does give an impression of a little bit of fakeness in my eyes. When mm. I see that in, I don't want to make fun of people, but when I see that in someone's bio, I go, oh, they've done some kind of shifty business course. Yeah. That's my first impression. Yeah. Look, I can't, I can't, I can't, I couldn't, I okay. couldn't, I couldn't. I agree. <laughs> I, I agree. I, no, I agree. It does give me a little bit of the, the ick, right? Mm. And yeah, I obviously, obviously there's a reason to it, you know, because it's very, very the norm, I want to say, in like a lot of businesses to sort of do that. And I do understand that like, yes, you need to speak to your audience and like maybe if, I don't know, like if you want people coming to your page and you want to know, you want them to know what you do and who you do it for, like, of course, but I, I don't know, like I think it's getting taken a little bit too far. And I also, I have a, I have a thought around like niche and understanding your niche or your audience, however you want to frame it. Like, I don't know whether you need to hunt for them. I think you should attract them. Like I think mm. you attract what you put out into the world. So most people in business or most coaches or you know, like anyone in small business, you often, if you're a founder, you often are your niche just like five to ten years ahead of what you're marketing to, right? So if you're putting that message out into the world and telling your story and storytelling of like, yes, I went through this, this is my struggle, this is my journey, and you're sharing that, you're going to attract your audience anyways, right? So I feel like a lot of the messaging should be done through your content and through consistency and through just like repetition of showing up as you are and putting out that message. And then you won't have to scream from the hilltop that it's like, I can help you lose five kilos. Mm -hmm. Like that, I don't know if that builds trust, but I just, I just see it so often, this specialized this such micro like targeting of niches and I don't know like I don't see any really successful people being that anchored in right I just see it a bit more of a broad approach and I'm not I'm not even hating on people like, I'm just saying like that's just what I see and I just feel like it, it is going to come in a wave like I can see all that stuff starting to wash out and people, as you said, getting a bit smarter. Yeah, because there's nothing wrong because I know people who have that in their bio are going to be like, oh, no, that's me. No. And we don't want to be like that. Like there's nothing wrong with you having a niche and finding that, but we're just noticing that people are so worried about their external appearance yeah. and trying to appear as an expert that it takes away from the actual job and working with clients because mm. we get that a lot even with training for example um there was someone who was posting hate comments on my page and then of course I go on his page why like disagreeing oh, he disagreed or? with something that I was saying um it was one of the people oh, we get a lot of people in America for some reason uh who they they do 
some study at university, but they're so like evidence based, quote mm. unquote. We get the evidence based people who don't actually train. They want to study for everything, and they come they come across my page and you know have a little word to me, and I just laugh because <laughs> I click on their page and they're like, he had back pain specialist. Uh. I help people out of back pain using evidence based science. This that, and then I looked on his page. Not one video of him training. It was just reciting studies, things like that. So I just think people need to spend more time with clients mm -hmm. actually doing the work. That is your billboard rather than your exterior trying to prove to the world you're an expert. Because I, I technically classify you and myself as experts in our field. Mm. We don't go around saying it. We're not show off. Yeah, I'll never say it. I think it. that I'm an expert at what I do and I think that you're an expert at what you're, you do but we don't come across in that way because it just makes me feel a bit weird if I were to say that about myself yeah. on my socials and all of that because I always think that there's more to learn. Yes. Yeah, there's, there's you can be an expert but with still with a student mentality Yeah, and that's important. Yeah, I don't know if I classify myself as an expert in what I do. Like, okay. I think I have, like, I definitely have, like, interests and I want to say expertise, right, like, in areas. But, like, yeah, I agree. Like, the people that walk out there and say, like, I'm an expert. <laughs> like, Andrew Human doesn't even say he's an expert at most things, right? Mm -hmm. They're the people you want to avoid, right? The ones mm -hmm. that are just saying, yuck, I'm an expert in this. Unless they're, like, I don't know, like – they've studied for decades and decades and decades and they really are like proven and expert and other people are calling them an expert. But see, I classify an expert because you can study your whole life and still be shit at what you do because you yeah. have no practical experience. That's true. I think it's a balance of it both. Is. Knowing how to use some science with practical experience and show me your client results and then then we'll decide if you're an expert yes. at the end of the day. Not how many books you've read from your your couch and they're not actually changing any lives it's true i think <laughs> as well like everyone's evidence-based these days oh and honestly me. you can find an article to almost support anything in the world yeah like you really can just google it and you'll find some research paper but does that mean that it's the truth and like there's there's i mean like all the time there's things that we believe is true being disproved mm -hmm. all the time right so it's for who and for what for some research might be applicable to some people and as we know the majority of research leaves out 50 percent of the population being women anyways so exactly you know you have to take a lot of research with a grain of salt um but then we also have to get curious when research comes out and it dis like it goes against our beliefs too like i think there's so much value in people that can be like oh wow that that goes against what i believe is there something here for me to learn Right, and they're willing to have that conversation rather than like shutting it down or being yep. so like black and white or like dogmatic in their approach. Like they're the ones, as you said, they're not sending you a message, they're commenting on your shit saying like you're wrong. And it's like educate me then. Like yeah. tell me your opinion, have a discussion. Like I'm always open for feedback. Like do you have something that I don't know? I'd love to chat. Like I love those people but I just I, – I cannot and I refuse to have like a civil conversation with someone that doesn't meet you with that same level of respect where they yeah. like come in at you and you're like if you would approach this in like other ways, invited me on your podcast to chat or like left a comment that I want to come back to or sent me a message, I would respond in a respectful way but I ask for that in return. Like nothing infuriates me more and I'm sure you get the exact same stuff. Yeah, I feel like you get a little bit more, well, you have a lot more followers than me and you Fuck cop them. it a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck but I people. definitely get it when I talk about, you know, technique, you need to have good technique. And mm. when I talk about, um, you know, the women's, the menstrual, the women's menstrual cycle, the menstrual cycle, things <laughs> like that. And he was actually a man who had a crack at me because oh. I was talking about... Things like that. So I just think people need to get over the fact of trying to be an expert and just actually help people and mm. get them results. Yep. Yeah. And if you're new to coaching, start broad and then hone in on a niche but mm. not super specific because then anyone outside of that niche will feel like you can't help them. Yeah. Why would you corn yourself like that? So true. And for anyone that's listening that's like not in the coaching space, I think it's like be curious about when you see these things online, right? Like if you see someone that is really niched, right? Like make sure you dig a little bit deeper and explore their content. 
I know that the, for the majority of people that come into coaching, they've listened to like every podcast. Yeah. They like know me better than I know myself. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's amazing it's because great. they know my values, they know my philosophies, they know what I'm about, they know I'm honest and transparent and they're coming in informed. They're not relying on like a one-liner in my bio to know yeah. what I do, right? <laughs> and I think if you're spending money, right, like any coaching service that you come into, like no one wants budget coaching. You're going to be investing in yourself, right? So it's important that you know like – who you're signing up to work with, what you're signing up for, what the values are of those people, not like just a one-liner in their bio, right? And the same applies for coaches. Like you have to lean on more than just the just the visual exterior. Like it takes consistency, repetition, long-form content, like showing up time and time again to really like show the world who you are and separate yourself in that way too. So I think it's here to stay, but I do think that the layers are going to start to unfold, which is all of that stuff. Hopefully. God. Hopefully. I think what that's a if, good thing. What if Instagram shuts down one day mm. and then that's your resume because people treat Instagram that's like I mean, a resume yeah, and it's like, well, then they've got nothing left because, yep. yeah, they were good at getting followers and making videos but they weren't actually working with yep. clients. Yeah. All social media does is expose who you are. Yeah. Right. So the bigger your platform are, the more that people know whether you're a good person or a shit person. Yeah. So, like, <laughs> <laughs> I just think you've got to be careful about the content you're being loud with right because how do you want to be reflected and it's the same thing like it's just exposing who you are so yeah. yeah take that with a grain of salt like whoever you are but then the same as like if I'm about to buy a product or a service off someone or invest in someone I'll be damned I know everything about them mm -hmm. do you know what I mean like and I'll, I'll back them because I'm associating myself with them so I'm saying like I agree with this person I stand next to that person right and I think that's important so yeah good one here to stay, but hopefully we'll change a little bit. Here to yeah. stay. So, fad <laughs> or future? That's what I wanted to make it about, segment. Oh, fad. Is oh, it a fad or no, it's future? it's future. It's future. It's future. Yeah, I was hoping it will be a fad, but it's future. Nah, it's future. <laughs> <laughs> Next, low-calorie diets or fasting approaches are emerging. <sighs> yeah. And this is what I was talking about with my, like, because I'm in Melbourne at the moment, this is where we record, and then I catch up with friends, family, and, of course, everyone wants some, um, you know, we want to chat about dieting and training and I love helping my mm. family with all this stuff. Yesterday I actually helped four family members in a row with their injuries and it oh, was nice. nice. Yeah. So Sharing. I love it. But then, then they start to talk about the diets and they're like, yeah, so – the main thing that I noticed, everyone's skipping breakfast. Yep. And it was massive. actually someone, I'm not going to say because some of my family listened to the podcast, but their mum's motto was breakfast makes you fat. Oh, and really? And that spiked my heart rate when wow. she told me that. Like people think that you need to fast to lose weight. Yes, it puts you in a calorie deficit, mm. but then they also have the problem of having those fuck it days where they just eat everything because they've been fasting. So that has definitely been around for such a long time and yeah. for some reason people just can't get their head around because they're uneducated on it they can't get their head around the fact of having regular meals without starving yourself in order to lose weight mm. blows my mind isn't it wild mm. again like some of these things are really starting to circulate like that was the craze when I was getting into fitness was fasting skipping breakfast like that 16 8 concept like yeah, that was that was the norm when we first entered, right? And then we went through this big phase. We're like, oh, no, like, you know, what was it? Like six meals frequently, you know, yeah. stoked the metabolism. Like then it went through that phase. And now I feel like we're actually coming back like the other side where mm. it's sort of becoming more popular again. And the other day I saw online, which I've started to see this more regularly and I won't name names. When you say online, do you mean TikTok or something? Because you see a lot of things no, that I don't just see. everywhere. I everywhere. Think everywhere, to be honest. Like yeah. whether it's podcasts or Instagram oh, or TikTok yeah. or YouTube, like anywhere. Mm. I feel like everything's this, like it's all pop culture, right, of what's yeah. circulating. But I saw this like well-known influencer sharing how she was doing like a 1,200 calorie diet. Oh, my God. To lose weight, right? And she was advocating for it. And this is someone who's like well educated and I understand like and I understand where she was coming from. She got severely hated on in this post because she was yeah. like her followers were like why are you putting this message out like even if it's what you're doing like can you think of the impact that this wow. could have on people and I completely agree. Part of me was like look 
it's so different to know, okay, well maybe if let's say you really wanted to lose a significant amount of weight in like four weeks and you'd been at maintenance 2000 plus calories for a long period of time and you had the education to cut down and do that. Yeah. Most people don't. And it's still those messages that feed into like toxic diet culture of, of people being like, oh, well, if such and such is dieting on 1200 calories, I should diet on such on 1200 calories. That mm-hmm. sounds right. It sort of feeds into that again. And I was like, one, if you have to eat 1,200 calories to lose weight, something's going on metabolically. Yeah. Like you probably don't spend enough time just eating at maintenance and not dieting to begin with. And you see this time and time again where these influencers dieting four or five times a year, circling around, trying to lose the same five kilos and regaining it over and over again. And it's no surprise that they have to restrict themselves so much. But that's not healthy. No. Right? That's not healthy and that's not the message that even as – like influencers or coaches, that's not the message that we should be putting out online. That's not the message we should be giving our followers, our clients, our people, our friends, our family, because it's so hard to unteach that, as you see, and you see how it filters into generations. Yeah, I'm so surprised that you're referring to people who are working in the industry because obviously when I was mentioning just before, you know, the generation before us, they learned that from their parents yeah. and they don't actually work in health and fitness. So I'm actually quite shocked to hear that it's people in the industry. But then as soon as you said the word influencer, ah, yeah. uh, just because, you know, you're an influencer doesn't mean you're actually educated or qualified to give out advice. But it's just unfortunate that influencers get so much airtime because they're so good at social media. Yeah, marketing. You know, they they might be putting out great content in a sense, but if only there was a way to screen what mm. they the information. Well, there was they a study out. done recently. I don't know if about you heard about influencers oh, advice. No. I think it was Ben or Carpenter. Do you follow him on socials? Oh, he's, he's puts out great to, content. Sorry. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, he's cool. Yeah, he made a piece of content reviewing this article or this research paper that they actually uh, – they did a, a research paper on – or a research study on influences in Australia in fitness industry, in the health and fitness industry. Oh, specifically really? Specifically nutrition. So they audited like X amount mm. of influencers' content. Uh, what was classified as an influencer? Do you remember? Anyone above 100,000 followers. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So they they did a research uh, study on influencers with 100K plus followers mm. Putting out nutritional advice, um, and I haven't read the I haven't read the research paper myself, but I was listening to the um, breakdown he was putting up, yeah. and it was like a hundred percent of it was incorrect. Oh wow! <laughs> so like once they dug deeper, the majority, or he said like close to a hundred percent, was actually not factual. Uh, the the nutritional advice that they were putting out, and also what they found was the higher the reach of the content, so the more views or the more likes, the less factual the information was. That makes sense. It it makes sense, right? Clickbait. Clickbait. Anything that's shocking or surprising is what's reached by the most people because you get the most engagement and vice versa. The stuff that's factual or important or from a textbook doesn't, right? And I think it's important because... One, like you can't, we know you can't always trust what you see online, but whether we like it or not, people trust people, you know? Yeah. So like if you've got someone that you follow and you like them as a person, etc., cetera, usually you're going to trust them. Of course. You know, you're going to trust them, but you can like a person and also think that they talk bullshit <laughs> as yeah. well and not take what they say like as factual, right? And just filter it a little bit and not be like, oh, well, you know, Sherelle said this must be true. Maybe not sometimes. Like I'm going to get things wrong and that's okay. Like we're all going to get things wrong. But there's a lot of people that take it for advantage, I will say. They they put it out knowing that they're being oh, of wrong. Course. Um, but, yeah, I think that was really interesting. Didn't surprise me at all, to be no. honest. But that sort of stuff is good for people to hear and see. Of course. Yeah, mm. we should definitely get our hands on that study. Obviously you weren't a part of it because if you were in the study, it wouldn't be 100% incorrect. I don't right? do much nutrition stuff anyway. Plus you're not even – influencer no, like you're I'm educated not. oh you can influ- <laughs> <laughs> well you know what I'm trying to yes, say yes yes um, so, I don't know what's wrong with me today you bring out this side in me love for it. some reason my wall's down love I'm it. gonna get in trouble today no, no but I love I, everyone I agree <laughs> I did a post on this the other day like there's a difference between an influencer <sighs> and a fitness bad. coach <laughs> no I know what you mean but there's a difference between an influencer and a fitness coach right an influencer in my opinion is an occupation 
It's like yeah. you make money off discount codes and influencing and selling products and services. That to me is different to what the the majority of the people we're talking about as yeah. well. They probably have like nutrition degree in their bio, which they probably don't, you know what I mean? So <laughs> anyone can put anything and portray themselves as anyone online. So it's just yeah. it's just a matter of like knowing who you're taking advice from and whether it's like applicable to you. And look, if there's a reel with like a million um, like views or likes, it's probably not entirely factual. It's probably more opinionated, to be honest, because that's what yeah. trends, that's what circulates. Because you know why? We've been doing this work for a very long time and it's not complicated. Now, I don't think simple. teaching people, and because we've done the time, teaching people about nutrition, mm -hmm. teaching people about training, rehab, it's very simple. People just have to nail the basics, but that isn't sexy. No. We try our best to make it sexy and appeal appeal to people watching it on Instagram. But yeah. at the end of the day, if you've got a sore back, I know you're going to be shit at planks. Yeah. But I, that can't be all my content because it's just not going to reach anyone. But that's what it takes. So yeah. we know that the people getting all those high reels and then making it fluffy and throwing in all these extra bits and pieces it's not actually going to help people but they're the ones getting the views so it's kind of I won't say unfair but also unfair because the ones doing the real work mm -hmm. with teaching the the boring principles that you do over and over again to get the best results aren't gonna reach millions of people on Instagram because you yeah. do have to sort of do up your content and that's fine but at the end of the day to get results it is quite simple yeah in my opinion yeah it's just like it's boring stuff, but it's principles over protocols. You know, everyone's talking about their protocols and their drop set <laughs> methods and their <laughs> calorie cycling and all this stuff. And it's like learn principles and you won't have to understand anyone's shitty protocols, right? Mm. Like protocols are just fancy ways so that you understand principles in a different way, right? And I think that like I'm biased as hell, but I just think <laughs> everyone should invest at least once in their life into something like coaching or mentoring of course. so they understand principles. Well, you're going to learn off TikTok. Well, like it's not going to happen. You need a coach. That's right. 100%. But people are like, oh, I need this like meal plan or this type of diet or this 1200 calorie diet or fasting. Mm. And it's like, no, no, no protocol calorie deficit right like and I know that word gets thrown around on the internet but when you understand that that's the principle that's achieving this result not skipping breakfast right then you actually have way more control and you you get to actually sustain the result because when you understand the principle or how you achieve a result that's what makes it well, that's what essentially makes it sustainable, yeah. right? When we understand it, but everyone wants it quick. Everyone wants it cheap. Everyone wants it fast. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem. That's why, that's why everyone has the problems that they do have and they can't sustain a result, unfortunately. Hey guys, I hope you're enjoying the episode. If you are, make sure that you take a screenshot, upload it to your socials and don't forget to tag us. I still think it's going to be future because yeah, I me don't too. see this mentality changing on the macro yeah. worldwide, honestly, no. whether you're in or out of the health and fitness industry, I still think people are going to think I'll just eat less. Yeah, eat less, move more. Works for a very short period of time, but not forever. No. The only other thing I'll say on the 1200 calorie diets is that there are no 1200 calorie diets that will support your vitamin and mineral needs. You will always be deficient in vitamins and minerals if you're eating a super low calorie diet, especially for a long period of time. You don't need it to lose body weight, you don't need it to lose body fat and you can get away with eating more and moving more and training more and being stronger and being fitter and healthier, right? Rather than just trying to starve yourself to weigh less. It's it's not really gonna get you far. And I, it's weird that I even have to say it. I know. But I just feel Sad. like it's, it's, it's still coming back around. It's mm. still coming back around. And I see it so much as well where I'm like, why are we still here? Like, why are you still eating so little calories? Even if you're not eating so little calories, you thinking that you're eating so little calories when you just don't realize that you're not being compliant because you can't stick to it. That's just as bad. You feel just as restricted. So spend some time, please, for everyone eating at least 2000 plus calories for the majority of a year, 80% of the year. And then when you actually go into a fat loss phase, it will work. Yeah. It will do its thing. You'll be consistent. You'll be compliant. You won't have to starve yourself to get there. Yeah. I only reached 14, 15 like peak week in a comp prep. Yep. I could not imagine. And I lost my period then mm. as well. So I couldn't even nah. imagine 1,200 so, calories. So really good point. I was actually reading this paper where they compared bodybuilders or physique 
competitors to people with eating disorders. You might have saw the screenshot that I put on my story oh, about the takeaways. Oh. And they were saying that like even people with eating disorders, like they did this big research paper article thing, um, only got down to as low as like 1,400 to 1,600 calories yeah, the, really. on average of people with anorexia. Obviously these are eating disorders, but they one disproved that even a lot of people are sticking to 1200 calories and not losing weight like they're like people with eating disorders are only averaging these calories yeah. maybe over here you're not actually doing that mm. um, but then the second thing is like that mental restriction thought like that's massive and the difference between the two groups like they were saying from a behavioral standpoint the only real difference is the the mindset side of things which yeah. needs to be assessed by a professional obviously but yeah yeah the whole low calorie thing I just wish it would wash away but I'm very similar to you I think the lowest mine ever got 13 1400 yeah. right and i think i would have been like 50 we what, were tiny. five kilos mm. you know like yeah fuck i was hungry oh no i wouldn't <laughs> do it again i'd never do it again i was so hungry and all i thought about was food yeah right you remember you're just like so hungry all the time and like you'd blink slow yeah, oh. but the reason why we were able to lose the weight was because we did it over a long period of time. We maintained our muscle mass. Yeah. We had a coach. Trained for a hard. Lot of time, trained really we, these hard. These were consistent calories. Like we were weighing out our almond milk. Yeah, you know? e literally everything was weighed. So it's not as simple as cut down and you'll lose the weight. Yeah. There's a lot in it. So our best advice would be to reach out to a professional to guide you you know, for at least four months yeah. and then you can learn how to do it on your own. Yeah, because the problem isn't the low calories. It's like living there, right? We were there for what, maybe a couple weeks? Yeah, at max. At max, mm -hmm. like, but people just think they have to go right there. Yeah. And that's the problem. I'm like, if you're like 70 kilos or even 65 kilos and you've got to go down to that to lose more weight, like something's going on and yep. you need to get your bloods done or other areas looked at. Hormones, yeah, for sure. Mm. So what do you reckon, fat or future? Oh, fuck I'm going to say fad. Okay. I'm going to say fad. I, I'm Part of me is like, surely we have to get more educated You're going to come to one of my here. family gatherings. Oh, like, I'm no. But don't Same you guys story. like culturally eat like a lot of food? Like, you know, nah, but I'm pasta? talking about just when they're in their phase of, okay, that's enough. I'm going to lose oh, weight. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. And then yo. they just go, I haven't eaten today. I go, what? Yeah. yeah. It's up to you. I won't change your mind. Can I be optimistic? Of course, please. <laughs> I want you to be optimistic. No, look, unfortunately, like, this is going to be something. I mean, like weight loss medications, you know, it's, it's the future, unfortunately. And that's why, look, the fitness industry, you always have a job in it, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. Everyone's always going to need help and support and accountability and guidance in these areas. So, yeah, radio, let's say future. Future, unfortunately. Damn it. <sighs> Damn. Next up. All right, perimenopause and menopause training and nutrition. Mm. Yes. Yeah. What are you noticing around this? Well, the conversation is really becoming prevalent, isn't it? Like not even just – obviously women's health in general is getting way more light, whether yeah. it's around like endo and PCOS or obviously menstrual cycles. I feel like that's old news now. It's like old we all news. know this. Come on, guys, get Boring. up with the times. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's talking about this like new stage and I love it because I feel like women in their – I want to say like 40s and 50s, they have not got the airtime. They have had the worst luck when it comes to health and fitness advice. They have gotten it after they've needed it. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, periods are important. They're like, yeah, great. Work, it's done for us. I've had my kids. Yeah. Now what? Or it's like, oh, you know, you can lift weights when you're pregnant. They're like, great. I just didn't exercise because I thought it was harmful for my child. Yep. Like they got all the advice when they would sort of gone through those stages of life. And now I feel like, yes. Like those women in their 40s and 50s are finally getting some great advice and information that's actually going to help them now that they can utilise to improve their health, fitness and well-being as they're going through this chapter, which is perimenopausal and more menopausal um, stages as well. So, yeah, I just see it a lot, like whether it's podcasts or just like even some women in those ages now getting more in the content creation. I love that. Yeah. I'm like, go them. They're speaking on camera and, you know, they've obviously got um, – they've obviously outsourced some of the content creation or they're on podcasts that are championing uh, them and giving them the, the audience as well to speak. So, yeah, I just noticed a massive shift that it's becoming more of a – conversation in the yeah. fitness industry and it has not been there in the past no way it's beautiful because this is a natural part of life and as a woman you go through it and it's nice to know that people don't have to feel alone anymore if they are going through it or they did have a rough time 
And then not to mention us up and coming who will be entering these phases, it's kind of good to get a heads up because mm, a yeah. lot of people back then kind of took them by surprise on how the symptoms can affect them because the symptoms, there are a very long list of mm. symptoms that you get, you know, whether it be obviously uh, struggling to lose weight, bloating, insomnia, hair, yep. skin and nails, moods, anxiety, depression, you name it. It's kind of like PMS but on steroids. Oh, yeah. From what I've heard it's from like third people, puberty. Literally, you're going through it all, night sweats, waking up in pool of sweat. So it's really cool that we are having these conversations around it because, you know, that's what happens in your life. And the main thing is we're noticing that people are encouraging training during this time because I could not oh, yeah. imagine going through all that. You're feeling pretty down about yourself sometimes because your body's changing and then being told that you can't lift weights or you can't do that. You know, that's very disheartening. So yeah. now the advice, and you know, we had Stacey Sims on the mm. podcast a little while ago now and her motto was continue to lift heavy shit. And that was her words and that was so empowering. Yeah to know that you don't have to give up the training that you love or it's not too late to start improving your bone density and your muscle mass and holding mm. on to that. So it really gives women that push to go, no, I can still be that strong woman mm -hmm. just because I'm entering menopause doesn't mean it's all over. You know, I can still be that strong woman that I used to be beforehand. Yep. So it's really nice to see. Yeah. Do you know what kills me though is like, all the fitness marketing that's for women in that age group, it's like go out and do some Zumba or like a step class or oh, like that yeah. sort of stuff. And it's like, again, like I know they got the short end of the straw, like really only getting exposed to a lot of this later in life anyways, but they're the ones that actually need to be lifting heavy shit. Like they're the ones that actually need to be progressively overloading and making sure that they are loading up their skeleton to stay strong and build muscle and strength. And like anyone that says that, that you know like it's all downhill like no 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 it's it's absolutely not honestly the the women that we have like in their 40s and 50s in coaching fucking crush yeah like they have no excuses the they best. are the hardest workers in the room because mm. they've done hard shit right so they're like no 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 the gym's my time my yep. space like kids are off you know they're teenagers they can do their own shit now they don't have young young, young little kids at home yeah um and it's like their selfish era and i and love it because mm -hmm. it's so good to see like just people prioritizing themselves because I know a lot of women like even mentally they struggle to they go through that season with family where then the second and they have to put their kids first and you know obviously raising a family is expensive and they don't have the funds to invest in themselves etc but then I feel like once they get through that season there's like this second opportunity window and I wish it didn't have to wait that long as well mm. but sometimes it does um, where you do get to prioritize your own fitness your own training your own health nutrition especially if it's sort of been neglected or been an afterthought like in your 20s and 30s so yeah. Yeah, even if that conversation is simply like, hey, just because you're going through menopause at the moment, it doesn't mean that it's all downhill and it doesn't mean that you can't feel great and build muscle and build strength and work on your nutrition or lose weight or whatever it might be. Like you can absolutely achieve those goals in your 40s and 50s and probably beyond. They're unstoppable, that unstoppable. age group. They're like so they're inspiring. tough women mm. and I love it. And even if you don't consider yourself to be a tough woman, like start now. Yeah. It's okay. Like it's really not too late. Mm. But one thing I will say, because I've been learning a lot from Julie who I work with, because she's obviously gone through this. Um, I have no idea what it feels like to go through menopause, but one of her pieces of advice was to try and seek out a GP who actually does understand yeah. that because then they can advise you on hormone replacement, replacement. therapy yep. because – we know what it's like to go to a GP and get turned down for a blood test and mm. or go on the pill. They give us a hard time, but they also give women in that age a hard time too yeah. because one study came out many moons ago where apparently hormone replacement, it said that it can lead to other illnesses such as cancer and all of that. Mm. But the sample uh, that they used were people that were already unhealthy. They were yeah. overweight. They and were, they were drinkers, in their 60s or something as well. Later in life. So yep. th for some reason the GP, of course, they don't want to get in trouble they refer to that one study that was actually incorrect. So yeah. really try and find a GP who understands menopause mm. and, you know, the stages after menopause to get your hormones balanced out because you can do all the training and nutrition protocols in the world, but if your hormones are still out of whack, then 
you know, it's not going to help you fully. So yeah, hundred percent important. Really good. I listened to for anyone that's interested in this in like a bit more of a longer form. There's a really good podcast. Um, Andrew Huberman's, of course, <laughs> and he interviewed. I, I think her name is Mary Claire. Okay, she's pretty big on Instagram. She's got over a million followers, and she's in that menopausal um, realm. And she's a gynecologist as yeah, well, amazing. so she's quite um, experienced in what she does. And the podcast was pretty much all about like how to navigate through like perimenopause and menopause, what it actually means, what signifies perimenopause versus menopause, um, hormone replacement therapy. So she spoke a lot about that study and like it was actually done on women, you know, in their 60s. But if you get on hormonal replacement therapy early enough, that's when the benefits lie. Yeah. Like the later you leave it, the less benefits you get. So she broke all of that down and I think it's amazing because there's just not the research out there. And you know what infuriates me is people are like, oh, well, it's not in the research. It's like, yeah, there is none, Barry. Like yeah. there is no research Literally. out there on these conversations. So please Barry. stop telling us to refer to it. And um, if you're a male, like ease off, like go away, please. <laughs> I'm sick please of- Please don't tell me how I feel. I'm so yeah. sick of men telling me, oh, look, it doesn't happen all day, every day. I'm making out, it happens all the time. But <laughs> there's one or two that people pissed me off say because I, I made a post or something about you know training around the cycle look some women don't get symptoms good on you mm -hmm. but a lot of us do I've got a uterus and mine starts to hurt when I'm about to have my period yep. I'm not going to go pull a deadlift PB that is the last Absolutely thing that I'm going to bloody do yeah. so Barry comes into the DMs <laughs> oh, no, the back pain Barry. specialist the same guy with his yoga post so that's all he did which was mm -hmm. fine but whatever and telling me that there's no research on what I was saying around you have to tra change your training around your cycle. Yep. But I'm like, you don't know what it feels like to have a throbbing uterus, Barry. Yep. <laughs> and you never will, so go away. Yes. Oh, don't even get me started. Yeah, you'd cop it. <sighs> Look, there's... <laughs> I, like, yes, one, please don't tell me how I feel. And like, <laughs> well, I yeah. hate that. I hate that. But the second thing is there's this whole thing of where people think that people are just saying, oh, well, if you're on your period, then you only do yoga. And then well, if no. you're not, then you lift heavy weights. And that's not what we're saying. No. We're saying there's nuance, like information inside of this. Like it's very niched in what we're talking about. And if you have these things, this can help. Yes. So like we're out here trying to help people. Yeah. If you don't like my opinion and if you don't like my advice, please don't take it. Mm. It's not even relevant because you don't have a uterus, Barry. <laughs> so like it doesn't even matter. But fair enough, there's people out there that are like fear-mongering saying like only yoga when you've got when you're bleeding okay. like there is that sort of whole training around your cycle you only do this then and this then oh no that's incorrect like we all know that you're not gonna train half of the month because like, you might feel good you might feel good so and there's also like training. other variables like if you've had I know for me personally if I've had like a really stressful month or I haven't been eating very well then I know I'm gonna be hit hard when yeah. I get my period with more PMS symptoms versus if I'm on holidays or like I'm pulling back at work, stress is low, sleep's been good, nutrition's been good. I can get my period and be like, oh, I didn't expect you. Hello. Yeah. And yeah. no symptoms. So like not every woman is the same. Not every cycle is the same, nor are we saying that it is, right? We're giving out general guidelines from a woman with a uterus yep. that mm. some people can choose to take or leave. And that's, that's okay. Yeah. And don't, for, for the male coaches or even male listeners, don't be scared to talk to, even though we probably appeared off like pretty scary just then. Don't, <laughs> I'm about to get my period, so um, I'm actually aggressive oh, right now. <laughs> I'm ovulating, so I'm on top of the world. There we go. It's a Good good time. Um, yeah. <laughs> but don't be scared to openly talk to your clients about it within reasons of your boundaries. If you have a good relationship with a female client, just say, hey, do you notice any changes around that time of yep. the month? And they can either open the door of discussion or just not talk about it if they're not comfortable. And that's fine. But as a male coach, it's very important to still uh, seek out information mm. on menopause, training around the cycle, things like that, because it will affect your client's session and it can affect their mood as well. You yeah. Know, if they do experience symptoms. Yeah. Yeah. Really good point. One quick tip for any male coaches out there that we do that I feel like would be really helpful because it can be a little bit awkward, right? Of if they want to, they're not quite sure. One, we don't find it awkward, do we? Like no. I've had, I've really only had male coaches and I've always been asked about my cycle and, you know, symptoms, menstruation, et cetera, being quite normal. I'm not awkward. I can tell sometimes they are asked me. I'm like, look, no, it's fine. Like yeah. you can ask me anything. But a good tip is like included in your induction onboarding process. Yeah. Like when you do your form, you can ask a couple of questions about their cycle. So like 
one, have you experienced any irregular any irregularities with your menstrual cycle or do you have a regular menstrual cycle, right? Yeah. You can ask that and you can ask, like, ask you, are you on contraception? Mm-hmm. If they tick yes, then you almost like don't worry about most of the things they're that they're going to tell anything. you because it's not a, it's not like a real bleed, if that makes sense. Yeah. And then if that pops up, then you can ignore the rest. And then maybe you could ask something else, like, is this something you would, you would feel comfortable talking about, yep. you know, and then they can tick that if they want to. But please don't feel comfortable. We need to open the conversation, whether it's like, um, having your period because some women come into coaching without a period, you know, and they'll exactly. say, I haven't had my period in six months. And that's really important for us. Yep. So I'm like, great. We know exactly what the number one focus is right now, restoring health right, yep. and recovery. So that's important. But then the second thing is it opens up the door for like conversations like this. You know, if you have a client that starts to go through perimenopause, you want to be able to pick up on that and notice what's happening with her too. So yes, love the conversation. I definitely think it's future. I think that in maybe another, I want to say three to five years, uh, this conversation will be mainstream. This is not mainstream at the moment. It's very much niche in fitness industry and health, yeah, I would sure. say. Whereas, uh, yeah, I reckon another three to five years, we'll start to see these sorts of things becoming normal. Definitely agree. Future as well, which is yep. very exciting. Yeah. Very Go exciting. Us. Go Go us. for the women. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, and Lucky the last loves. one we wanted to chat about was um, people investing money or time or energy uh, in health and fitness more than ever before. I don't know if this is something that you've noticed, but even five, ten years ago, definitely ten years ago, but even five years ago, having a coach was quite niched. Or like even having yeah. a training program was like, oh, you follow something. Like you actually – do something that you progress from it was quite like niched it was it was only seen by people that are like training for something like competitors or bodybuilders or uh, athletes in a sport or yeah like having a coach to work towards a particular goal and then you didn't have one you know it was on and off whereas now I feel like I definitely see this a lot but I have a lot of clients coming in like wanting long-term coaching like I don't want something short and quick and cheap I want to do it properly and I want to set myself up for these later stages or pregnancy or postpartum whatever it might be and I just see it becoming a bit more ingrained in the way we live rather than something we do to achieve this big shiny thing Um, which I think is great because a lot of people think they need a really big goal to start working towards bettering themselves, which is definitely not the case. No, you're spot on. I think people are realising that it is becoming very hard to do it on your own. Yeah. So they are willing to invest for the most part into a coach who will just show them the way and teach them the tools. And I'm sure you'll get this a lot with new clients. They actually want to learn what's going on with their body because they can still see a lot of people who give them their protocol. They do it for a bit. They don't really understand what's why it's important, why they have to do that protocol. They stop with that coach and then they're back at square one. Yeah, it doesn't work. No, so they actually do want that education and the word education does come up a lot because people are realising, hey, I don't need to have a crazy goal. You know, this is about health and wellness and longevity for the long term. Mm. It's getting hard to do it on my own. Mm. I will invest for this period of time and then learn the tools to do it ongoing. So... Mm. There are a lot more people, I feel. And I think it's also because social media shows that there are more options for coaching. It doesn't seem so niche now to to have a coach. And there are lifestyle coaches, there are comp prep coaches, powerlifting. Goes back to the first point, doesn't it? Goes back to the first point, yes. Um, People are realising, hey, I can be helped with my goals. I just need to reach out to that person. So it is nice to know that on the flip side, there are some people who don't want the quick fixes, but mm. very different demographics. Yeah, it is. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I agree. Even like just the awareness, I think, in how important health and fitness really is for longevity, like that awareness in itself and the whole, you know, biohacking. It's like everyone has a smart watch. Everyone has an aura ring or a whoop band or something where they're tracking data to work on their health and yeah. utilizing that in some way. So it's not even just coaching that I'm talking about. It's like, the want and the need to invest because it's such a status symbol these days. It's like if you look after yourself, it's like what does it tell people? 
It's like, I don't have my aura ring on, but it's literally an identity thing. It's like, yeah. it's like I value my health and fitness uh, that I'm willing to spend like $2,000 on a ring. You know, it says to people, it's like people driving around in a Tesla. Yeah. It's like, they don't care about the Tesla, Tesla, but it's like, I look after the economy. I look after the world, the pollution, right? That's <laughs> why I don't appreciate cars with a good motor. <laughs> yeah. Well, oh, well, I don't know anything about cars. No, so <laughs> keep me out of it. But the <laughs> actions that we do and what we put our money and energy and time into, it tells the world who we are, yeah. right? So it's our identity. And I think that, I mean, like, absolutely it's mine. Do you know what I mean? Like I'm a healthy, fit person. And I think that when we can have a strong identity to things that align with what's important to us and these biological needs of being healthy for the rest of our lives, it makes us do the thing. It's like if I'm going to go away overseas, I'm probably going to still go to the gym, right, because that's part of my identity. So I think they're all positive things. I think it's great. Um, I think it's just, as you said, like the exposure and the awareness of like, social media as well exposing it online coaching making it accessible yeah too like we have a lot of clients that go over to europe and continue coaching of course. i'm like fucking good that's yeah. great obviously good for us but go for yeah, you like, true. i want that for you whereas i reckon a couple of years ago people would be like nah i'm off Gone. going over party hard yep. there is no middle ground whereas a lot of people are seeing that you know it doesn't have to be all achieving everything and then nothing that all or nothing is starting to close it's definitely the future, but it's a long way away forever. I don't know if yeah. it'll ever be the full reality, but it's starting to close, which is great. Yeah, because people are getting satisfaction out, out of a health and wellness journey. Yeah. You mentioned status, but then they're also feeling educated, empowered. You know, you just feel better as a human. It's not just about flogging yourself in the gym to reach a low body weight. Yeah. It's actually a lifestyle and it gives you more of those feel good Mm. hormones and feelings more so than getting you know loose on a holiday for some people you know? <laughs> yeah <laughs> getting lit on a holiday yes. um so yeah 100 percent agree that it is the future i don't think the gap will ever close nah. completely as a society yeah. worldwide but it's heading in a really nice direction yeah for sure i agree i agree well this was fun fat or future <laughs> um Really curious to hear like whether you guys agree with us or, you know, whether there's been any thoughts come up, especially for a lot of the coaches or people in the fitness industry as well. I'm always like trying to, I don't know, just sort of like look around at the landscape. I think when you work in it, you mm. see it in such a different way rather than being like a consumer all the time. You're sort of thinking about why people do things in the way that they do or why this is trending or like, yeah, just why things are happening. So, yeah, I hope you guys got some great insight. And always, if you did like today's episode, share it with a friend. It's what makes the world go around and <laughs> specifically our podcast go around. Um, so make sure you share this episode with a friend if you did enjoy it. And our tough love is out of love as well. There oh, some, always. Oh, we care more you guys. brutal in this episode than I have been. And I now I'm having it. chatter We're, about it. So don't it. take it personally, guys, because we love you. It's not just me getting attacked. Okay? <laughs> Come at Danny. No, come don't, at Danny. Don't. If Danny ever triggered you, make sure she you tell her. She a bad no. influence. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't do it in Apple reviews. In, no, do it through DMs or on. Actually, Danny told me she prefers it on comments, obviously, if you just do no, that. Delete, delete. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. If you're enjoying the podcast, please leave us a five star review and hit follow so you can stay up to date with our podcast every week.